we're talking about veganism. Yes, we are. We're talking about the V word, the big and u- ugly V word that divides and brings up so much for so many people. But that's the topic here today on this week's episode of Alter Your Health Live, your source, as always, of information and inspiration to promote the holistic transformation of your health and the health of our planet. I'm your host, Dr. Benjamin Alter. And I'm your co-host, Dr. Susanna Alter. And if it's your first time coming through, be sure to subscribe, rate, review, give us a wave, give us a like, give us a thumbs up if you're on Facebook or Instagram Live. And Patreon. And we just launched a Patreon account to support us specifically in this podcast adventure because, you know, we are naturopathic doctors. We are, we are small business entrepreneurs that are trying to make it work and every little su- bit of support helps outside of our clinical practice. Yeah, our goal is to raise enough money to hire someone to produce these videos. Because it's really energetically (laughs) draining for me. It's not my expertise, although, you know, I do feel, you know, passionate about getting this message out, getting this information out. Um, So we are talking about um, veganism today, which is something that we dabble with here and there on the podcast. We've had a number of really great guests talk about the subject from different angles and perspectives, from health to environment and sustainability. And most recently, we had the guest, uh, Dr. Stephen Hussey. He um, was, you know, more of a paleo kind of guy. And we kind of had this friendly debate that a lot of people have given some feedback around. And I, I just wanted to take advantage of an opportunity to dive in a little bit deeper into our you know, personal philosophies and connections with our vegan choices in life, you know, from health to environment to animal um, animal rights and all of that kind of stuff. So we're going to cover a lot today. We are going to cover a lot. We're going to try to do it concisely as the, the intention always is on these, you know, shorter live episodes. So Susanna, why are you vegan? <laughs> <laughs> All right, concisely. Well, what I, before I jump into it, I just want to say I think it's really beautiful how um, the journey to choosing to live a vegan lifestyle is very, very personal for each individual, and so we may demonstrate that in sharing mm-hmm. our stories today. Um, but honestly, I think the first time I ever had any kind of idea to limit animal products in my diet was actually in college and I was studying Buddhism and I was just kind of intrigued um, about, you know, live kind of following that, that Buddhist way of living. And so my friend and I decided to go vegan for a month. And this was also right before I traveled to Nepal for a semester where most Hindus, um, well, certainly Buddhists keep meat out of their diet, but also just the, the Nepali lifestyle, they don't eat that much meat, whether you are Hindu or Buddhist. And so my family was eating yogurt pretty often, but no meat. And so I went about five months without eating any meat, although I was eating a little dairy here and there. And I actually got really sick. I got very sick thin, very anemic, but I was also dealing with a lot of stress just being away from home. I wasn't eating enough. Um, and I was also f- afraid of eating the, the rice rich diet because I had heard over and over again that carbs are bad for you and rice is bad for you. So I just really wasn't eating enough. And I got this story in my head that I couldn't thrive on a vegan diet, that my constitution just needed meat. And so I shifted back to eating meat for the rest of college. And up until when I met Ben and started dating Ben. Whoops. (laughs) And um, should I continue with the rest of my story real fast? Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. I I mean, I think I Because al- you didn't go vegan yet. I did I haven't gone vegan yet. Yeah, and so. I always still had this thought that it would be really wonderful for the planet 
and for animals if I did go vegan, but that, oh gosh, shucks, it's just my bad, you know, luck of the draw that I have this constitution that can't handle a vegan diet. Um, but when I started dating Ben and he had just been coming off of a vegan diet, he started just, you know, little comments here and there about how he felt like meat wasn't ever really necessary. And um, all like his his talk about it was starting to kind of hit me in different ways. Meanwhile, we were starting to play around with some more kind of juice cleansing. And I noticed after, when I would come off of these juice cleanses, I just naturally didn't feel like eating animal products. So slowly, slowly, we just kind of stopped eating a lot of meat. It, it went from maybe once a month to once every three months. We would eat fish a little bit more often than meat. But finally, one day, Ben invited me to attend a screening of What the Health with him at our school. And it really, really shocked me. I think the biggest thing that shocks me about What the Health, if you haven't seen it, is that it talks about the corruption behind a lot of these health organizations that will put out these dietary guidelines for serious chronic diseases supporting the consumption of certain processed animal products when the research clearly states that things like processed meat are a carcinogen. And I I just didn't like the feeling of being fooled and duped by those big organizations. So more than anything, I didn't want to eat meat because I didn't want to vote with my dollar. I didn't want to put any more support into that kind of business. And so that was kind of the big shift for me, but it was just kind of, it, it was really engraved a little bit more a few weeks later when a speaker came to our school. His name is Silas Shrow. One of the producers of What the Health. Yes, exactly. And he talked about the environmental impacts of not only eating meat, but also consuming dairy, that actually dairy production has a much, much bigger toll on our environment than you would think. So um, this just really, really, like, at that point, I was, I was done. And I just, I was just done. It was just a clear switch within myself that my body doesn't need these foods. And, and I also realized that my history of anemia was more likely due to the fact that I wasn't eating enough and that I also didn't have a very healthy digestive system. So I wasn't absorbing the iron and the nutrients that I was putting into my mouth. So how, how was that? Was that succinct enough? I feel like it was too long. <laughs> that was all right. You, okay. left, you left me a little space to, uh, to give my version. <laughs> okay. And uh, I think, you know, as we've commented on in numerous other conversations and podcasts, your health has improved since giving up oh, meat. A yeah. lot of people, a lot of people think it's some sort of sacrifice that they're not going to be as strong. They're not going to be as has have as much energy. They're not going to be as resilient and heal as fast, and all these sort of beliefs and ideas um, around not eating meat. Um, but I think you know, even for s some sort of constitutions that maybe do do really well with meat, like yours, Susanna you do even better without meat. And I, I think that's just a testament to how, you know, anyone can thrive on a plant-based diet. So notice that we are using the word vegan today as opposed <laughs> to plant-based like, like we typically talk about. Because I think when we talk about veganism, we are obviously implying that there's more to it than just our health. And um, to be honest with you, I came into veganism predominantly just focusing on my health. I guess you could say I was a little bit selfish. I wasn't really thinking about the environment. I re wasn't really thinking about the animals. Um, I was studying nutrition before medical school, and I was encouraged to experiment with my diet. And slowly but surely, I just cut things out of my diet. And before I knew it, I was like a raw vegan and just eating fruits and vegetables pretty much. But that only really lasted for a few months. And I felt really great. I did. I felt like, wow, I'm like, I don't know. I just felt so clean and I felt like a lot of energy. And maybe I had that kind of 
honeymoon high, <laughs> honeymoon effect with the, the vegan diet, and I felt really good. Um, and as the years went on, it was just maybe three or four years, which is kind of the classic time frame um, for people who go vegan and they feel really good for a few years. And then it's very common for people to not feel good after three or four years. And there's a number of different reasons why that can be the most common and, you know, the most common of which is vitamin B12 issues. Um, so maybe that was happening with me, but I think what was more likely happening was similar to Susanna's story. I simply wasn't eating enough food. And as a result, I became, I also, you know, struggled with borderline, borderline anemia throughout those years. And in the third year of medical school, I went to a naturopathic doctor and got some blood work done and got a number of things uh, tested, including my complete blood panel um, and my hormones. And it turned out that my testosterone level was like um, in the tank. And that was, this was after introducing more animal food, after meeting Susanna, I, I guess we were eating meat probably once a week or so. Mm -hmm. And my naturopathic doctor told me that I need more protein. And that, you know, I wasn't really thinking about protein. I wasn't th really thinking about macronutrients. I wasn't thinking about anything. But what I really, what really resonated was the, the word more. I needed more. And um, in addition to more um, food, I needed more exercise. And we, you know, my, my doc, he consulted me or counseled me on the importance of like high intensity interval training, which I'm really you know, enthusiastic about and passionate about still, and how important that is for balancing hormones, especially for men, boosting testosterone and growth hormone and all of these things. So I started exercising kind of more religiously with the high intensity interval training. I started eating more. I wouldn't say that I was eating more protein. I was just eating more, being a little bit more mindful of my caloric consumption, because I, I think that I you know, since I was born, maybe I, n I never really had a really good gauge of um, awareness of my hunger, like when I was hungry, and when I was full, I would really rely on social cues. And like, if it was dinner time, it was I would eat. And if I had a plate of food, I ate the plate of food, and then I would stop, even though I wasn't really didn't know if I was really full. Um, so Anyways, I, I, I went back and got my hormones tested again like three months later. I was eating more food, not eating more meat or anything like that, but I was exercising regularly and my testosterone went from 200 to 650. 200 is like low even for an 85-year-old man. 650 is very normal for any, any man of my age or you know older or younger. Um, so that was, you know, so I felt, so I had this kind of connection with nutrition and how important it was to really fuel my body with adequate nutrients. And I knew that I felt really good on a plant-based diet without any meat, dairy, or eggs. I had done that for years before. And I realized it kind of just clicked that, wow, I just need to eat more food. I just need to bring more food in my body, especially considering that I'm, I've always been an active person. I burned through a lot of calories just because of my activity level. And for the for probably most of my life, I was chronically malnourished. I wasn't bringing enough nutrients in. So when Susanna and I kind of together slowly started eliminating animal products, and it was just fish for a while, we were just eating like a can of sardines once a week or something. And we, we, we just stopped doing that. And obviously, when you're not eating a can of sardines a week, you're going to be eating more other foods. And um, at that point in time, I was, we were becoming familiar with Dr. John McDougall's work and the starch solution, how really filling up on starchy carbohydrates is really the optimal way to fuel the body. So I replaced all the, you know, plant or all the animal protein, you would say, with in terms of the fish with starchy foods like rice, beans, potatoes, carbohydrates. And uh, I never really had a carbohydrate fear like you did, Susanna. 
But um, I think I did, you know, on some level have a calorie fear that I, I, I just like, you know, if I ate too much, I would just get, you know, get fat. And I, you know, I, I didn't want like that. That was really something that I never wanted to happen to me <laughs> as silly as it sounds. And I know I'm thin and I know I'm active, but I've always had that running in the back of my head. So knowing that I could fuel myself like wouldn't have didn't have to think about um the amount of food i and like I, I i trusted that i was feeling myself with the proper nutrients and i trusted that i wouldn't couldn't you know get fat or anything like that i just want to share real fast yeah the first time ben and i okay the first time he invited me over for dinner quick, 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 quick. yes i know i know he made kitchery which is a rice and mung bean kind of dish and he served he served me up my serving and it was this small little bowl. And I looked at that and I remember thinking, oh my gosh, does he realize I'm going to have to come back for thirds or maybe fourths? <laughs> and I was thinking, oh no, is this bad that I eat more than the guy I'm dating? Yeah. But um, it all Slow, worked out. Slowly but surely, I have learned to eat as much as Susanna. And I think my health has improved as a result of that. Um, so, you know, obviously we're the, the topic of this is why we're vegan. And we talked about kind of our unique journeys to becoming vegan. But I think that the answering the question of why we've taken this journey um, has to do, like we kind of touched upon, it has to do with our health, has to do with the health of the planet, has to do with the health of the animals, our fellow animals on this planet. And I think that we confidently took this path because we knew deep down and trusted deep down inside of ourselves that we could thrive on plants alone. And I think that documentaries like What the Health, like Cowspiracy and like Forks Over Knives, the ones that are more health oriented, um, point to uh, point to the fact that human beings thrive on a plant-based diet. And as we talked about on the last podcast with Dr. Stephen Hussey, when we had our little friendly debate, he was bringing up all of these uh, potential deficiencies that can be acquired in a plant-based diet, specifically the fat-soluble vitamins, of course, B12, various um, amino acids. And those kind of things are all theoretical. They're all theoretical. I have never heard of any person on a long-term vegan diet acquiring any sort of vitamin or mineral or protein deficiency. More, more than a more than their omnivorous, you know, counterparts. People have de develop all sorts of mineral and vitamin, you know, potentially vitamin deficiencies, but it doesn't have to do with the food that they're eating, it has to do with the integrity and health of the digestive system that is absorbing that food, mm -hmm. which, um, you know, on a plant-based diet, you create a more resilient digestive system because it's able to break down all the starches, you know, the fiber is, you know, creating really strong, high integrity um, junctions between the intestinal cells and all that sort of stuff. Anyways, yeah. I'll let you talk, Susanna. Yeah, well, just to add to that, like, for example, I think B12 is the biggest, the biggest argument for deficiencies in plant-based diets. And actually, when you look at people that do eat an om omnivorous diet, there's pretty much just as much B12 deficiency. So yeah. there's, there's, there's... B12 doesn't come from animals. There's doctors out there that do recommend just everyone supplement with B12, not specifically plant-based people. Yeah. But okay, that so, aside. So we uh, so we kind of covered the health from right. We we got to the point of the health. Like what? Well, I really like Dr. Furman's approach and and like just seeking out nutrient dense foods. Uh, you know, health equals nutrient density, calories, nutrients over calories. So we're we're really you know nutrients. We're fueled by nutrients, and when we look at foods, you know from plant foods to grains and legumes to, you know, animal foods. It's the plant foods that have the highest nutrient density, despite what, you know, <laughs> what Dr. Stephen Hussey says. Um, you know, the, some of these animal foods have high levels of, you know, quote unquote, active vitamin A or D or K or anything like that. But it's not those ap active, uh, you know, vitamins and compounds that 
are important because we're able to activate those things inside of ourselves. So health, you're like blank staring. So health, <laughs> well, we- just because, because I do want to speak. Yeah, well, we, okay. So we're done with health for now, even though this is all to your health, but health has to do with more, more than just you and your body. It has to do with like, Yes, well, Ben, we we have a lot of podcast episodes where we talk about the health impacts of eating a plant-based diet and the health benefits of eating a plant-based diet. And I'd say for both of us, the reason why we went vegan originally was for health reasons. You know, I will speak for myself when I say I wasn't thinking so much about the rights of the animals. I wasn't thinking so much about the environmental impact. But as I did shift to a plant-based diet, I noticed naturally I started becoming so much more sympathetic to animal suffering. Empathetic. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Empathetic. So, so it's, it's so true. I, I echo that as well. And, um, I think that the reason why that is, you know, <laughs> I think it's very, you know, energetic, spiritual, but I think it has a lot to do with karma and, um, you know, we're all, we talk about often how we're all compassionate, loving beings at our core. Like that is the essence of who we are. And I think if you were to talk to anyone on the street, you would see that compassionate essence inside of them. You, you would be able to connect with that. And so many people have actions, are taking action in their life that are out of alignment with that compassionate core. And food choices is one way that we are acting out of alignment with our compassionate core multiple times per day. And people don't realize how uncompassionate food choices can be. But if you watch a movie like Earthlings, which I watched last night and Susanna couldn't handle, um, there's really no way around it. There's no such thing as humane meat. There's no such thing as humane dairy or eggs. These, you know, getting these substances that are not required for our health is never a compassionate process. We are stealing and exploiting animals so like to on exponential levels that that are it's just mind boggling to consider how many animals are exploited, killed, murdered, separated from their families and used just for to satisfy human cravings for meat, dairy, and eggs. And that's just the food sector alone. In the Earthlings movie, you know, they get into sports and hunting and fishing and rodeos and circuses. They get into um, clothing, of course. They get into pets and uh, and scientific experimentation on animals, which is... You know, some people say there's no way around it, but what they're doing is unnecessary. It's unnecessary. And um, I think that the more human beings can act in integrity with their compassionate core, the healthier we are as a society, the healthier we are individually. And I think that a lot of dis-ease comes from that misalignment and incongruence with our actions and our essence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. People talk about the energetic effects of eating meat on one's body and consciousness. And I've had people ask me the question, do you, do you feel emotionally different since you've stopped eating meat? And there is kind of an Ayurvedic point of view that if you do eat animal products, you are taking in some of this like, Rajic energy, which is the, kind of that fiery anger, kind of violent energy. And when you think about the, the state that the animals are in when they are killed, they're in a state of fear and stress, and the body releases those stress hormones. It actually does stay in the meat. So when, we, when we're eating meat, we're also eating that the actual stress hormones right so it's energetic and it's physiologic you mm -hmm. know where there's also i think it's an ayurvedic saying that when we digest food we're digesting all of it we're digesting everything that went into creating that food mm -hmm. and from the emotions and from the resources 
as well as, of course, the nutrients. Mm -hmm. And I think that if we look at our food system and we consider trying to digest what is going on out there, that is going to lead to some indigestion. That is going to lead to some difficulties in health. If, mm -hmm. we, if we consider like we are taking that in, it is disturbing. I mean, if all, if all food stores had an image of what the animal had to go through in order for it to be placed on the shelf mm -hmm. in its brightly colored package, I don't think anyone would honestly want to consume it. Well, I think some people may, you know, if they're really, you know, if they just, you know, people can turn their, their head and people are turning their heads. I think that it takes a lot of courage. But I don't want it to seem too, like, I don't want to be putting judgment. Like, I don't no, want No, I'm not to be... judging the people yeah. that are turning their heads. It takes a lot of courage and, uh, you know, willingness to look at things for as, as they are. And uh, I think that we're in this society that enables us and allows us to disregard and ignore all of these gruesome processes that go into our food production. And I think that a lot of people just stay inside that, that, sh that, that box and that bubble and don't, um, yeah. And yeah, and I did, I did for years, the majority of my life. And, um, and yes. So, so one, one conclusion that we came to, if any of you listened to the last podcast with Stephen Hussey, it was a longer one and the fiery debate one. One conclusion that we came to is we would come a long way if we just raised, collectively raised our level of awareness and consciousness when it comes to our food choices on a daily basis. And in addition to our food choices, like all choices, if we only just became more aware of really what we're bringing into our body and really our impact as human beings on this planet, then we would bring come a long way. Because I think when we do that, we naturally fall into a more graceful, non-violent, and compassionate way of acting and living. And because compassion is your core, once again, we've said it a number of times, and I'm not lying, I believe it truly deeply that we are all the same loving essence the same compassionate core mm -hmm. so i think that we should you know without judgment knowing that we're all on this unique spiritual evolutionary journey together coming back home to our compassionate essence i encourage us all to act in greater alignment when it comes to our food choices, when it comes to our clothing choices, when it comes to our transportation around this world and whether we're, how, what we're, what we're, what we're using and how we're using it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And just also, you know, to, to really, I just really want to speak to the non judgmental piece about this because for, for me, I know that if, anyone had told me you need to go vegan before I was ready, it wouldn't have happened. I would have resisted yeah. it. Don't go vegan. Whatever you do, don't <clears throat> so go vegan. Like I just want to make sure that listeners are yeah. not hearing us saying you need to go vegan right now. You need to go vegan. You're a bad person if you're not vegan because that's not what we're saying at all. The reason why we are inspired to speak today about this topic is because it was those people who spoke out about it that sparked the inspiration within us to make that change in our life. Mm -hmm. It wasn't them who told us we need to, it came within ourselves. And for that reason, I don't feel forced against my will. I don't feel, you know, like other people are judging me for not being, being. I, it's just, it's just, that's what's most important is that you follow your own wisdom, your own inner wisdom. And, that's all I have to say about that. And we're here to support you. Yeah. And so are so is the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. You are supported in all of your choices and actions. And we uh, we have our compassion for you just as much as the animals have our compassion. Mm -hmm. And the rest of the beings on this planet and in this universe have our compassion. Um, you know, and yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, so environment. And, 
environment? Oh, are we continuing on? I just want to speak a little bit about environment because the truth is the health of the human race depends on the health of the planet. And right now, the direction that the health of the planet is going in is a very, very bad direction. And a lot of it has to do with the dwindling population of, of species in the wild due to them being pushed out of their natural habitats not only because the human population is increasing but because the population of cows and other agricultural animals is increasing for the purpose of human consumption so mm. when we think about really really healing the planet the way that we can do so through our food choices is to stop bringing more and more cows and other animals onto the planet just for the sake of feeding human appetites. Right. You know, a lot of people are aware of this growing population problem. And uh, it's so true. And everyone's like, what do we do? What do we do? Who do we, who are we going to have to kill to like, you know, what race or gender are we going to have to limit in order to, uh, you know, sustain humanity on this planet, on this earth? And the easy answer is that all humans can flourish. All animals can flourish. What the, what we, all we need to do is stop putting animals here artificially, like you said. And it's a self-correcting problem. There isn't a population problem when it comes to human beings on the planet. There's, there's room for plenty of human beings. I think that we could have 10, 12 billion human beings on this planet as long as they were acting responsibly, as long as they were consuming, um, you know, living with a, the, the footprint necessary and no more um, when it comes to their consumption. And uh, so, yeah, we... <laughs> and then also just factory farming, of course, has very, yeah. very harmful and toxic byproducts. Yeah, everyone, you know, I don't know anyone really besides maybe the factory farmers themselves that are like, yeah, factory farming, more factory farming. But, you know, factory farming is actually the most sustainable way to produce the amount of meat, dairy and eggs that that human beings consume on our planet at this time. Um, it, it may sound crazy to consider that, wait, factory farming is sustainable. But it actually is. It uses the least amount of resources. They box th everyone in in the smallest amount of of land mass, and they get them. You know th that they're driven by nothing other than, um, you know, profits. And when you consider that profits are really, you, you know, if you're going to be motivated to, you know, increase your profits, then you're going to use as the minimal amount of resources as, as possible. So that's what factory farming is doing. And they do a really good job of creating a lot of food with not a lot of resources. So if we were to all go to a more like humane, uh, regenerative kind of agriculture where cows are grazing and we're milking cows in the backyard and chickens are pecking away, and we're trying to feed the planet, that uh, the planet of meat consuming animals, uh, meat, meat consuming humans, with with those with that level of farming there is absolutely not enough earth to sustain all of the um the animals that that are, would be required to produce the meat dairy and eggs that humans eat and consume so factory farming is actually like has been saving the planet when you think about it in that way obviously well, the, not really <laughs> well no not really but if we were just if we were just consuming grass-fed beef and um, you know, have, having a more like small scale farming operations everywhere, there wouldn't be any land and uh, there wouldn't be any um, trees. <laughs> there wouldn't be any forests. There wouldn't be any grasslands. It would all just be grazed fields. There wouldn't be any, you know, greenery to sequester all the carbon that we're emitting, you know, in, on this as living on this planet. So factory farming actually is the sustainable way of farming. But it's obviously not the answer. The answer is drastically, like drastically, very extremely drastically minimizing uh, meat consumption. Yeah. So we've rambled. Oh, but the truth is that Ben and I, we spend a lot of time 
at night in bed <sighs> when we're about to go to sleep thinking about just like the state of the planet's health, human's health, and well, animal animal health comes up too we're <laughs> humans are animals i think yeah. we, we need to realize that like there's but it's the... more of the animal populations that come up that's just very depressing yeah. um when you look at the dwindling the dwindling numbers of um of wild our animals. happy wild animals and so w the question that always comes up when we're talking about this is just like how how can we be of service how can we help reverse this so that our health does flourish. The planet's health does flourish. The populations of wild animals do regenerate. How can we be of service? How can we share this message most effectively? And I don't know, this is the best we've got so far. If yeah. you guys have any ideas for us, please let us know because I mean, when we just consider also the health of our future generations, their health also depends on what we're doing today. So if you want your daughter and your son to grow up in a beautiful world, it's really important that we don't let things just continue in the direction that it's going in. Yeah. I'm starting, I'm almost going to cry. <laughs> I'm like, well, it's, it's like, it's, it's serious stuff. It's serious mm -hmm. stuff. And obviously I think we need to approach this, uh, you know, in a lighthearted and, um, you know, optimistic and positive way. But it's it's serious stuff, and so yeah. If you do have any feedback or ideas of how to, um, obviously, once again, we've we've said it a few times, but our message is not for you to go vegan right now or next week or anytime. Our message is just for you to connect with yourself, and I think if we were all to do that, we'd the world would be a beautiful place if we were all deeply connected with ourselves. Because when we're connected with ourselves, we act in the most compassionate ways that we can given our environment and resources and knowledge and tools and experience in that time. So um, so that's really, I think, our, our the fundamental message is just promoting self-awareness, self-realization, self-connection. And uh, we're all in this together. We're doing our best and we're not claiming to be perfect. I'm really ashamed oftentimes with the amount of plastic that is being getting thrown away in our trash can and recycling or well, there's a lot of plastic that's like non-recyclable, like oh, all yeah. the cellophane yeah. saran wrap and is that what it is? Yeah. Um, but any, anyways, so we're all, you know, making efforts, strides together. And I think we have to, we have to like band together and really, you know, something's got to change. Like we're, we're, I think we're hitting critical mass. We're getting there in terms of this level of awareness and understanding, but I don't know if we're going fast enough. I guess we'll, I guess we'll see. So that that's all I've got to say. Yeah. <laughs> And hopefully this isn't ending on any sort of downer note. And obviously, if you guys do want to learn more about our practice and um, and how maybe the group coaching program could support us all in kind of striding together, obviously on uh, when it comes to whole food, plant-based nutrition, but also living just more mindfully in general, check it out, mm -hmm. alter.health. And uh, anything else? That's it. Thanks for bearing with us. It's been a longer live, but uh, we, we hope you enjoyed and we appreciate any comments or feedback. Peace and love and until next time. Bye-bye.